Welcome back to the Marshall Thundering Herd Dynasty. Somehow, some way, Marshall has snuck into the college football playoff as the only group of five team to make the playoffs here in season number one. Due to a really rough season for group of five teams, we somehow snuck into the playoff after defeating really the best team, I think, in all of the group of five conferences in Louisiana. They were 11 and one going into the Sun Belt Championship game, and we won on a game winning field goal, 23 to 20. So that means the best group of five champion will make the playoff, and here we are at the 12 seed. Just looking around the rest of the conferences, I think we really got helped out a lot. North Texas uh, ended up being the best team in the American at, with an 8-5 and five record. Liberty ended up winning the Conference USA Championship. I really thought they had a chance to make the playoff, but they lost a few games. Akron and Miami University ended up going to the Conference Championship with Miami winning their second straight MAC title. UNLV and Nevada met up in the Mountain West Conference Championship, and UNLV won their sixth straight game. And then obviously we know the result in the Sun Belt Conference as Louisiana lost their second game of the season to us, and we ended up clinching our spot here. Here are the final results. Like I said, Liberty won their championship. Utah ended up winning in the Big 12, defeating Oklahoma State. Akron ended up losing by 10 to Miami, Ohio. Akron could have had a chance to get in, but they did lose a few games. Uh, so three losses probably wouldn't have got them in there. East Carolina ended up losing to North Texas in the American Athletic Conference Championship. In the Mountain West, UNLV won 16-7. Alabama was your SEC champion this year, defeating Ole Miss. Miami goes to the ACC Championship for the first time in a long time. They lose to Pittsburgh, but the big surprise is Michigan blew out Ohio State 50 to nothing. When I saw this, I could not believe it. I'm not sure if Michigan is nerfed in this game or what, but Ohio State, 2 of 10 on third downs. They were only 0 of 1 on fourth down. They had three turnovers in the game. Alex Orgy threw for two touchdowns. Donovan Edwards ran for two. So did Mullings behind him. It was just a dominant performance, and Michigan punches their ticket into the college football playoff, but so does Ohio State. They're, they both make it, and Will Howard throws three interceptions in that game. Well, back to our action here. We face the best team in the country. There's no doubt about it. They are the number one team for a reason. They've lost two games, did not make the SEC championship, but they do have Carson Beck still as their quarterback. They still have Trevor Etienne, who transferred over from Florida to be their starting tailback. They also have Robinson, who is a very capable back. He is more of a power back. He has a whole lot of physical tools to him. And then you go over to receiver and tight end. Dylan Bell, one of their best leading receivers this year. He led them in yards. Dominic Lovett had 12 touchdown catches this season. Humphreys had a great season as well. Then there's the best tight end probably in the country in Oscar Delp, in my opinion. And then behind him, you have Ben Yurasek, who transferred over from Stanford after being one of the best tight ends in the country over there. So they are just very, very deep. And I didn't even mention their defense. They have just a ton of guys there. They have playmakers all around the field even on their offensive line, which I am not going to talk about. So really, we are huge underdogs here. And if we want to have a shot, we have to put our best foot forward. There's no doubt about it. And here is Malachi Starks, the best player on the entire Georgia roster. He is amazing. I do not want to throw his way. He is a ball hawk if there ever was one. And today we are huge underdogs on the road at Sanford Stadium. So this is going to be an uphill battle for your thundering herd. But we made the playoffs. Let's get this game underway. As here is Elijah Metcalf back to receive the opening kickoff. And that is going to be uh, returned to the 16-yard line. And that's going to bring out Cole Pennington, who's had a decent season so far. We've put up some good numbers, but not against SEC competition. So Actually, A.J. Turner is a little bit banged up coming into this game, and the first carry he gets is a loss of one yard tackled in the backfield by the D-line. 
Second and 12, quick throw. This one's tipped at the line, almost caught by Tyshawn Chapman. Can't believe he didn't hang on to that one. It's now a third and 12. Pennington in the pocket, steps up, throws across the middle to Braylon Brown, the transfer, and he picks up eight, and we have an early three and out. So here is Carson Beck in this Georgia offense, starting it out under center, play action, fake throwing to the tight end, Oscar Delp. He does only get a gain of one, but he had a whole lot of field in front of him. Second and nine, this time running London Humphreys in motion. Beck throws across the middle into a tight window, and that one is caught. It's going to be short of the first down as they go for it here on third and four, and they throw it, and that's going to be caught by Dominic Lovett. 12 touchdown catches on the year, and he picks up a first down. Now just at the edge of field goal range this time. Running the tight end in motion, that's Ben Urasek out of Stanford. He throws across the middle, though, and he finds Oscar Delp inside the 15. Tackle at about the 10, and they just about got goal to goal here on this drive. As Oscar Delp runs in motion this time, it's a play-action fake to ETN, and this is going to be a throw out of bounds by Carson Beck. As now they get it to a third and 10 still at the 11-yard line. Can we come up with a stop here? to maybe hold him to a field goal. Here is Beck moving in the pocket, throws this one. And it looks like this one was a throwaway, and we do get them to settle for three. So I will call this drive a win for the defense as the offense comes back out onto the field down by three. A different look to start this drive here. Five wide, and it's a wide open Tyshawn Chapman with space. He gets a gain of 20, and he's pushed out of bounds after that big catch and run. And a first down. Close to the 50-yard line. Pennington running. Looks like Braylon Brown in motion. Oh, that's Tyshawn Chapman. A blitzer around the edge gets to him, but he does get rid of it. And we got to watch out here. We might have to get rid of the ball a lot quicker this game. Here's a draw play up the middle. A.J. Turner, and he gets scooped off of his feet. As Turner is an All-American. Just remember that. Here's a third and sixth throw across the middle. It's Cade Conley. He had A.J. Par uh, Turner wide open. He decides to go to Cade Conley, the tight end, for a first down. First and ten again. Pennington's got time. He's got room as well. He's going to take off in Pennington. This has been something he's been using the last couple of weeks, moving in the pocket, using his legs. It's a gain of 11. Screen call out to A.J. Turner. He's got blocking downfield. Logan Osborne, the senior center, Gets a couple of nice blocks downfield. A.J. Turner is a little bit shaken up coming into this game. He's got some wear and tear. We definitely have to monitor that. But he is going to stay in the game here for a first and goal carry. He's inside the five, turning up field and pushing his way forward to the four. In comes Barry and McFadden off the bench. This is the first time we're seeing him get some action. He gets the orbit screen. He runs to the pylon. It's a touchdown. Marshall takes the lead. Oh, my goodness. How about that drive by Marshall? And we take the lead here on the road. Nobody saw that drive coming. Here is ETN to the right side. He picks up a gain of two. Second and eight now, play action fake. Beck throws wide open downfield. That's Oscar Delp again. And he gets pushed out of bounds at about the 48-yard line. It's another first and 10 now. This is an RPO this time to the other tight end. Ben, you're a second. He picks up about a gain of 15 for another first down. So now they are pretty much in field goal range for them. Here's a handoff to Trevor Etienne, and he picks up. About four. As now they are at the 31 this time. Back throws, and it's an open man again. It's Oscar Delt beating Monroe Beard in coverage, and they are definitely exploiting those matchups with Oscar Delp and Urasek. And now they are at the seven. Wide open in the end zone. Colby Young for the touchdown. And Georgia strikes right back. That drive seemed way too easy. Here is Pennington now after that nice drive. Good blocking up front. A.J. Turner picks up a few yards all the way to the 27. We give it right back to him on a third and one, and he cuts up field. Another gain of nine for him. So he remains in the game now. Here is Pennington moving in the pocket. He's got a wide open man, and this one is dropped. 
Tyshawn Chapman was wide open for a first down and more. It's a third and nine now. Pennington gets rid of it after the pressure gets to him. And that big drop costs us on that drive. The throw was a little bit behind, but is it, if it hits you in the hands like that, you got to hold on. Here is ETN with the carry, running over Tykez's legs, by the way. But he does lose a yard on that carry. Third and seven now, about five minutes to go here in the first half. Here is Beck throwing downfield, wide open. It's going to be Colby Young. It's a touchdown for Georgia. I have no idea what Dayton Smith was doing on this play. He watches Colby Young run right past him, and he was so worried about Oscar Delp that he left his man go right into his zone. I have no idea what type of defense that was. And now we find ourselves down by 10 after just having the lead. Here is Tyshawn Chapman on the next drive, starting it out with a nice 11-yard catch and run. Here is Turner again, and we're going to get a heavy dose of Turner today because he is really recognized as one of the best offensive players, especially with the honors that he's been getting across the NCAA. Remember, he is an All-American tailback. Third and six now, throwing, and that is dropped by Cade Conley. That's one you got to hold on to. We're forced to punt here and giving George the ball back here with about three and a half minutes to go. Maybe we can force a turnover here. Here is ETN with the spin move. And he picks up about a gain of nine. Close to the 41. They have about 60 yards to go here before Paydirt. As here is Beck under center, handing the ball off to ETN. And he somehow fights off Isaiah Gibson. What do you do in this situation? The biggest guy on our team gets thrown to the side by the smallest back on their roster. Just incredible. Now close to the 50-yard line now. Under two minutes to go. The two-minute warning has come as Beck is in the pocket now moving. He eventually tries to get rid of it. It's Michael Green who gets to the quarterback. He's had a couple of nice games lately, by the way. And he forces the punt here as we do have one more possession before halftime. Here is Pennington now throwing to the right side and completes he and Tyshawn Chapman haven't been on the same page, at least in the first half so far. Pennington stepping up in the pocket, and he will go down, but the ball goes down too, and it's picked up by the defense. Michael Williams falls on it, and Marshall turns the ball over. And this is one thing you can't do, give this Georgia Bulldogs offense great field position like this. Screen pass called out to ETN. He gets around the edge. Jumps out of bounds, pushed out of bounds at about the four-yard line. Third and four now. Beck stepping up, throwing to the end zone. Is that caught? Yes, it is. Oscar Delp again. It's a touchdown. And now Georgia, down seven to three, has now scored 21 unanswered points. 40 seconds to go in the first half. Here's a throw to a wide open Chapman. He's got space, and he will get out of bounds. That speed does kill in the open field. And he gets to the 37 for a first down. They send the nickel blitz on this one, and it works. We tried to go deep on that one on a shot play, but Georgia was prepared. And we just run the ball here, get us into halftime. And wow, what a change of events there in that second quarter. It's 24 to 7. So here we go, second half action now coming your way as we had some decent moments, but Georgia looks like they may be just a little too strong. Here's an RPO action, quick throw to left side, and that one is caught for about a gain of six yards maybe. Second and four this time, ETN in the backfield. Here's a quick throw this time to number 16, London Humphreys, and he cuts his way out to the outside, and Dateon Smith does get the tackle. First and 10 again. Here's another RPO, and that's a wide open Dominic Lovett. He gets pushed out of bounds at about the 31-yard line and a first down. Georgia is moving the ball at will, it seems like. They have definitely hit their stride. Here's a quick throw on the RPO. It's Oscar Delp, who, Delp, who does not follow his blockers on that one, but does pick up, pick up enough for the first down. So now here is a play action fake throwing across the middle of the field and look who it is. It's number eight again for the touchdown. Colby Young has been killing us today. He's had a couple of long touchdowns and he gets in easily making it 31 to seven. 
Busted coverages have been happening, happening a lot in this game here for the Marshall defense. And our offense has to pick up the slack. Third and four. Here's a wide open Chuck Montgomery. He cuts inside. He's off to the races. Chuck Montgomery to the five. Touchdown. The junior takes it the distance. And that's what we needed. Some type of big play to give us a little bit of momentum. And Montgomery does it himself. We do line up to go for the two-point conversion here to bring it within 16 points. Here is Pennington throwing to the sideline. Turner tries to fight forward, but two defenders there to stop him before the goal line. Reverse score here, 31 to 13, as here is a quick throw. And this is going to be Yurasek again. He picks up the first down. I mean, pick a tight end, whoever they want. Oscar Delp or Yurasek, they're getting the ball quite a bit. Here's a quick throw across the middle. That one is caught. It's another catch by Dominic Lovett, who's been really good today as well. Running Delp in motion this time. Probably going to give it to ETN. No, it's a play action fake. Throwing up the seam. It's Humphreys again. Oh, my goodness. No matter what they do, it seems like they're getting 15, 20-yard gains. Here is a big run. It's ETN inside the five. But what do you do? 73 pancakes. One of our two of our best players on the roster and then gets one more shot in there at the end it's crazy now they're inside the five handoff that time stopped by Tykez legs and now they're back at the four for a third and goal under center is Beck throwing and what do you know another tight end touchdown to Ben Yerasek and Georgia rolls here in the third quarter and now here is Pennington back onto the field, giving it to the senior Ethan Payne. We haven't heard his name much, but the big reason why we haven't been playing him is because we need speed when we run the football, especially versus Georgia. Ethan Payne isn't the speediest back. He's more of a power back, even though this is probably his final college game here. We're down big. Here is Pennington, this time stepping up, trying to get it to Turner, but too much pressure that time. Gabe Harris there on the hit. And now it is third and 10 into the fourth quarter. This time Pennington throws to the sideline and it's Turner, but he's just short of the first down marker and we're down by all these, all this score right here. It's 38-13, we gotta go for it. Pennington gets hit. He had Chapman open, but could not get rid of it. The big issue with Pennington this year, I, would, I wouldn't even say it's been a big issue, but in those situations, he does not have a quick release. So you really have to anticipate a lot of throws of Pennington. He has one of the longer throwing motions in this game. So definitely something to look out for if you're controlling Marshall. Here is pressure that time on Beck. And we do get a nice little three and out this time. But they're in field goal range. This is from about 52 yards out. And the kick will be right down the middle as he had about 10 more yards on that kick as well. It's officially 41 to 13. Here's a throw across the middle, and that's Chapman again. He's dropped a couple of passes like that. That one wasn't deflected. It looked like it, but it was just a drop. Third and 10 now. They send a cover zero blitz. Here's a deep shot. Looking for Chapman again, and this time he holds on. Four for 104. He does have a couple of drops to his name, but he does pick up the big first down right there. Pennington's been a lot of fun to play with this year, especially with that deep ball. As here is, once again, Barry and McFadden in the game, showing what he can do, spinning away from a tackle. This is a bit of a preview for next year as well because McFadden's going to start to get more playing time next season as Ethan Payne does graduate. That number two running back spot is definitely opening up. It's going to be an open competition. Second and eight now, Carey. And that time, McFadden gets a gain of six. He deserves to stay in a little bit longer here for a third and two. We give it right back to him. He tries to find the space, but this time it's not going to work. He's two yards short of the marker, and now it's fourth and two. Running Chapman in motion. We give it to him. He's got the speed to get to the outside, and he steps out of bounds at about the eight-yard line. We can get some good learning lessons here within the last four minutes of the game. As here is Pennington now under pressure. He gets hit hard from behind. Michael Williams forces it, and Malachi Starks picks it up, and he will take it the distance. 48-13 to 13 in Georgia's favor. I mean, what do you do in this situation? The pressure's right there. You got to try to step up, and two guys hit you and force the fumble. 
Nothing Pennington can do. So in comes the third string quarterback, Ja'Kai Long into the game, looking to get the red shirt freshman some experience as Turner takes that one up the middle. Now Ja'Kai Long is more of an option type of quarterback. He can run, and here's a nice catch and run by Tyshawn Chapman making a man miss. He gets hit at about the 48, and it's a first down. Chapman having himself a huge game, even with those two drops. Ethan Payne in the game. We're going to start to get him some playing time here as this is his last career game here with the Thundering Herd. That's going to be A.J. Turner. He loses one. Second and 11 now, Ja'Kai Long. Looks like he's running the speed option. He pitches it to Turner, but it's behind him, and it causes and it allows the Georgia defense to catch up to him. And now it's a third and 14. Blitz around the left edge, but nobody's home to the right, so Ja'Kai Long just tries to leg it out, and he can't get anywhere. This could be the game. Fourth and 14. Long in the pocket, throwing across the middle, looking for... It looks like Chuck Montgomery, and that will do it here. Our playoff hopes were really short-lived. Pretty much ended in the second quarter there. What a big-time game by Georgia. It was more of a tune-up game for them, if we're being honest. 48-13 to ends up being the final. And I would say our team did not do too bad. I think Georgia was just a better football team. They had much better players. Their, I think their offensive scheme was amazing. They ran a lot of motion. They got the ball to the tight ends, which is definitely our – it's actually a scenario we haven't truly faced this year. We haven't faced great tight ends at all. Like, usually we've been facing really good receivers, but for the first time this season, I think those are the two best tight ends we've ever faced. So it was definitely a different look. We'll definitely learn from that, but it was definitely something that our defense was not used to. And seeing, you know, obviously the skill of Georgia, it definitely made a difference. Uh, but I would say that our, you know, our team did pretty well today. I'd say our offense did pretty good too because Cole Pennington, despite being 13 of 30, and a lot of those were just because he was hit on a lot of throws, he was really, really good. Like, he was impressive on a national stage. Gotta love that for Pennington. And who knows, you know, that could get him some bigger looks. The transfer portal is real. So you never know what could happen there. Tyshawn Chapman, though, as well, on a big stage to go for 138 on Georgia. I mean, you don't get that opportunity every day. And then Chuck Montgomery, the junior, can't wait to see what he can do next year. He had a big catch, and it went for a touchdown. It was his only catch. So now we prepare for the offseason. And I realize I made a mistake here. I actually tried to fire our offensive and defensive coordinators, which is what I wanted to do, but I waited too late. You have to do it on the conference championship uh, week or before that. If you wait until bowl season, you can no longer do it, which is kind of dumb to me. Like, I think you should still be able to do that, but I guess I missed out on that opportunity. So I can no longer fire my offensive or defensive coordinators, unless I'm missing something here. We decide to upgrade our motivator tree, and I mostly want to put that on offensive linemen specifically you'll see why because we are losing four of our five starters on the offensive linemen they are all seniors alabama is your national champion this year in season one they went 15 and one won the sec championship obviously uh beat out old miss georgia did not make it but georgia ended up losing in the next round anyway to Pitt. and just recapping the season overall let's just talk about you know our team and Look into the future and look at some of our recruits we have coming up because these are this is going to be a big year, especially with a lot of positions we have that have juniors and seniors, which we have quite a few of them. So you're going to see a lot of freshmen coming in and playing right away. We don't have any award winners except Elijah Metcalf, who won Returner of the Year. But looking at the rest of the awards, a lot of them were taken home by Alabama players. And I guess rightfully so. They won the national championship how about Louisiana's coach, coaching staff? They won all of the uh, coaching awards. Coach of the year and coordinator of the year. They were pretty good. And then uh, just looking at the rest of the awards, awards here, here is Elijah Metcalf. He had three uh, kick returns for touchdowns on the year. He didn't have any punt returns, but he had three kick returns, which I think led the country. Here are how, how all the other Sun Belt teams did in the bowl season. Appalachian State defeated Liberty. I was actually very curious on this. One feature I wish was in the game is that you can watch games. I would 
Would have really loved to watch that game. We didn't get to face Appalachian State this year, which I'm going to bring back divisions in the offseason. I, I think I've already said that before, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to bring divisions back in the Sun Belt. In real life, they are the only still comp, still the only conference to still have divisions. So I want to bring that back here in this game. So let's just recap the season and talk about some of the players. Cole Pennington, 31 touchdowns, 17 interceptions, a really good season from him. And like I said, on a big national stage to play that well, definitely speaks to the type of quarterback that he is. He's just going to get better. Braylon Braxton's probably going to be transferring. That's more than likely going to happen. And we won't convince him. We want him to move on and get a starting job. But we'll see what our quarterback of the future looks like in recruiting. A.J. Turner ran for nine touchdowns, 808 yards. Like I said, he was a first-team All-American, which is pretty cool. I don't know if he deserved it, but I will take it. Ethan Payne ran for three touchdowns, only 169 yards. One thing I do want to emphasize going into next year is that I want to run the ball a lot better. And I don't know if that starts with the offensive line or we need to add more of a dynamic backfield. I guess we're going to build that up in the offseason and see what we can come up with. At receiver, Tyshawn Chapman, 81 receptions, 1,300 yards, 11 touchdowns. He was absolutely amazing. He ends up finishing top 10 in the nation in receiving yards. He was as good as you can get. And I had the idea coming into this series that Chapman would be the focal point of this offense, and that was it. And it ended up happening. So I'm very, very happy about the season he had. Chuck Montgomery will be returning for next season. Now, his deal breaker is playing time. Technically, he is the fourth guy on the depth chart behind uh, Braylon Brown, Chapman, and, well, I guess he's third. So I wonder if that's going to uh, actually play a part in if he's going to stay or not. Cade Conley has a deal breaker. Um, I believe he's going to still stay. We'll see. Elijah Metcalf had 16 for 165. And then Trey Allen was a guy that I played early in the season. He actually had two touchdown catches, only five receptions, and we didn't really play him too much from there. But A.J. Turner, I see kind of see why he had 487 yards receiving three touchdowns and over 50 catches. So I guess all-purpose yards, he was really, really good. That maybe makes sense why he was an All-American. Talking about the offensive line, we had a decent season, but it wasn't great. Elijah Ellis was supposed to be our best offensive lineman, or at least one of them. He was called for so many holding calls. It was crazy. Jeremy Jones was actually our left tackle. He won uh, first team all Sun Belt. He was really good. But as you look at these guys like Bryce Ramsey, like Logan Osborne, and those other two I mentioned with Jones and Ellis, those are all seniors. We are losing three senior four senior starters on the offensive line. We only really have one returner, and that is Ramsey at right guard. So we're really going to have to figure out what we're going to do here on the offensive line. It could be a little bit of a rebuild up front, but we'll see what we do in recruiting in the offseason. Defensively, I thought we had a really good year defending the pass. We intercepted a lot of passes. We saw a lot of good playmakers. Josh Moten was one early in the season. He forced a few fumbles. But I would say our biggest weakness this year and maybe what could have made us better getting us out of situations was really getting after the passer. That's one thing that we did not do well. Tykez Legs was really good up front. Isaiah Gibson was also really good up front. Those guys are both seniors and both going to be graduating. Michael Green is a sophomore. He's going to be returning. He had a five-sack season, and you saw late in the year he started to come around. So he ended up having the team high in sacks with five. So hopefully he can build on that and, you know, be better as a junior. Jabari Ishmael, I just don't know what he's going to be. I'm going to have some freshmen coming in, and they're definitely going to be vying for playing time. So his starting spot was short-lived. Remember, we started Poloni Franklin towards the end of the season, and I'd say they were pretty much both equal production. So we'll see what happens at the other defensive end spot. Michael Green isn't in jeopardy of losing his. But defensive tackle, we're going to have to replace both of those. But really, the strength of our defense was the secondary. Amir Foster and Corey Myrick, the freshman, both had six interceptions each. Josh Bolton had four. He forced a few fumbles, like I said earlier. Monroe Beard's a senior as well. Dateon Smith is terrible in coverage. So I don't know if he's going to be necessarily a starter next year in the same capacity. I'm not exactly sure. He could be converting over to linebacker as well. Kicking-wise, we only kicked 14 field goals, which is kind of crazy to me. I felt like 
out of a whole season, you would kick more than 14, but I guess that's it. Nine of 14. And then our punts, 38.5 is the average, which is okay. That's not good. It's not bad. It's just okay. And then return-wise, Elijah Metcalf ran three back, and he ends up being an uh, All-American for that, as well as winning the best returner. Chuck Montgomery also ran one back as well. So let's talk recruiting as we look to fill up these uh, a lot of those spots that we saw by seniors. But one thing I want to add is some explosiveness. Let's start with a couple of quarterbacks here that are athletes, which means they could play different positions. Courtney Lyles is a lefty, 6'1", 191. Now, what I like about him is that he is kind of slight of frame, but he's quick. He's got 90 acceleration, 92 speed, 91 throw power. The accuracy is a little lower, though, and it's not where you would want it to be for a quarterback. Now, our two, our second recruit here is DeAndre Hendricks. Much like Corey, Courtney Lyles, both of these guys are impact development traits, so they are going to develop at a faster rate than normal. Now, Hendricks has a weaker arm, 89 throw power, but a little bit higher of accuracy, so he might be a quarterback we could develop, and he's also a righty, and he's a little bit bigger at six foot two. But then let's talk about the positions that we really need. First is Julius Levitre. We're going to make sure he commits. He's going to be probably a starting tackle, either left or right. But Neville Sampson, he is probably one of the best gets that we have so far, and he did commit. He's probably going to start day one as a nose tackle, as that big run stuffer we need up the middle. Then there's the local kid, Kalechi Nwangu, who is, who is really good. I can't wait for him to get on campus, but he is only normal dev. Neville Sampson, I believe, was impact dev. But my prize guy that I have been moving up the board, I haven't talked about him, I've been hiding him a little bit, is Lonnie Curry. Five foot 11 only, but that's a good size for, I guess, for college quarterback. I guess it's normal. Maybe not good size, but it's normal. But 95 throw power, 85 short, 86 medium, 93 speed, 92 excel. He's technically a bust, but I'm guessing it's because he is maybe smaller in frame nothing on his ratings say he's a bust which is crazy to me but then we add another quarterback that's an athlete and Hashim Banagu now Banagu is interesting because he is six foot four 199 we are competing against Alabama Penn State Ohio State Clemson all the big dogs but I think Banagu might not be a quarterback despite him having good short and medium accuracy Six foot four, he's 95 speed, 92 acceleration. He looks like a wide out to me. And to be quite honest with you, if he has receiver skills, I'm pretty sure we're going to use him at receiver. I think the door is open for all of those athletes. We have four of them, so we'll get to see what they play best at, but it's just something to keep your eye on. Monty Mayweather is a good tight end. I want to develop. We have Cade Conley, but I think there's a question mark around Conley. Like, is he going to transfer? Is he going to stay? So I definitely want to get Monty Mayweather in the door. He's a two-star. I really, really like him. I went after him early in the season, along with Jaden Duck. Jaden Duck is a really, really good defensive end. I like his speed, 75 speed, decent strength at 81, 74 power moves. That's going to develop. Now, he's only normal dev trait, so that kind of sucks. But then let's talk about the big speedster in this class, and that's Dewan Whitehead. Six foot two, very slight of frame at 175, but he's got 97 speed. He also has the gold fan favorite and the silver best friend, so he's going to help out the quarterback with the composure there, and he's also an impact development trait. We obviously missed out on Danny Jocelyn. He was one of my favorite recruits, though. I can't, I can't even lie, so I'm going to remove him from the board, but uh, he's a guy that I want to note that we missed out on. But I said I wanted to add some playmaking ability at the running back position alongside A.J. Turner because we'll see what Turner ends up doing going into next year. Will he develop well or maybe not? But we decide to go after Brian Santana, who's got clear-headed winning time and safety valve as his abilities, and he's impact dev. But maybe the best get of this recruiting class, I have him only ranked at 13, is Kerry Cage. He is a star development trait. So if you don't know, there is normal, impact, star, and then elite. He is the second highest dev trait you can get. And he's 81 speed coming off of the edge. I can't wait to see how he looks as an edge rusher. And he is a top candidate right now for me to be our top edge rusher as a freshman. Ahmad Wilkes, we miss out on. He goes to NIU. 
I decide to add some more cornerbacks after missing out on Danny Jocelyn. One is Lloyd Short. He is a three-star prospect. I decide not to fully scout him because I didn't want to use the points there, but he looks pretty good. We'll see how good he is on campus. Three-star. He's ranked like 1,600 nationally. Tremaine LeBoy is a defensive tackle, and I definitely wanted to add a lot of defensive tackles this year just to have flexibility. He is probably the best uh, pass-rushing defensive tackle that we're recruiting this year. Dominic Denson is just a big body, 6'6", 333. He's just huge in the middle of the defense. And then there's Niles Waller. I'm not going to necessarily go after Waller as hard as the other defensive tackles. I think his his at least what I see right now, his skills aren't really that great. There's also BJ Khaled, one of the best names on the board. Uh, we are second with him, but I'm probably going to throttle that back a little bit. Like If I lose him, I lose him. Now, one guy I'm really disappointed in losing is Cliff Toure because I was going after him hard all season long, but Wisconsin ended up beating us out. Now, if you don't know, when we first created our coach, we created a Wisconsin pipeline, which is why you see a lot of Wisconsin players like Isaac Darnold on the board. Now, I am really from Wisconsin in real life, so I wanted to make that a kind of a realistic thing. Now, I like Darnold a lot. He is a great pass blocking center. And remember, we're losing Logan Osborne, our star center, uh, as he is graduating. So I want to add some offensive linemen that are really good pass blockers. Lane Burns is a good middle linebacker. He is 83 speed. We don't have him committed yet, so we'll, it's yet to see his development trait. Quincy Wint, another uh, halfback that we are recruiting. Keon Canada. It's kind of cool that they have athletes who are offensive linemen in this game. That's pretty awesome. J.D. Foster is a local kid. He's a running back out of Huntington, West Virginia. He commits to Akron. I was hoping to get him just because of the local story. That would have been pretty cool. He is a Juco guy, so he will come in as a junior. Darren Riggs is a guy that I was recruiting a little bit. Now, he is five foot eight. I wouldn't say that he is great. Doesn't really do too much too well, but he has a gold road dog. So we know he's going to show up on the road. Kona Kala Kalawai, like he was a punter that we were recruiting out of West Virginia. It looks like we might be out on him. James Nevis, another linebacker we added late, but it doesn't look like he's even thinking about what uh, Marshall in this situation. Dwayne Madden was a running back I was going after earlier. And then I want to highlight Duran Toure, who was the first player we added to the board. He was the only four star out of West Virginia, and he was also a local kid. He decides to go to Kansas. At the bottom of the board, I do want to highlight a couple of tight end athletes that we added. First is Patrick Kamalu. Now, Kamalu has gold, the natural, and he is also a team player. I look at his abilities here and his attributes. He looks like a very athletic tight end, which is something I want in this offense, especially after playing Oscar Delp. Like, he was dominant in that game that we just played. I think it would definitely be beneficial to get a really reliable and athletic tight end. So we decided to go after two here late. Co Coffee Goldsberry is another one of those guys. Very athletic. 82 catching as well. So he will be a reliable player catching the football for these young quarterbacks in the now and in the future. So that will do it for this episode. Next episode will be the offseason. And trust me, there's a lot of things coming in this offseason. You don't want to miss it. Hit subscribe. Hit that like button. Stay tuned. Let's get it. Let's go. I like getting money. I got time to get it. Target on me, so my car's a tenny. Dancing with the devil, I don't bargain with it. Bobbing in a dash, and the stick is with it. And I hit the four or five on the wet side. But I'm from the east side. This how we slide. This how we ride. Yeah, yeah. This how we.